Welcome to Lighting the Educational Flame, created and produced by educator and author Mark Hoberman, owner and director of Grade Success Tutoring. The purpose of this program is to offer our listeners a variety of stories dealing with many interesting topics surrounding education. It is our hope that students and parents alike will benefit from the wide range of topics, including study skills, test prep, anti-bullying, sports, music, and more. We hope you enjoy our show, Lighting the Educational Flame. Hello and welcome to the video podcast, Lighting the Educational Flame, brought to you by Great Success Education on the NETV Network. I am Mark Hoberman. Today we have a very special guest. His name is Nestor Torres. Nestor, it's great to have you here with us today. Thanks so much for joining us. Delighted to be here, Mark. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nestor Torres is well known for being an incredible flautist who transcends all aspects of traditional flute expectations. His performances are unlike any other I've ever seen by a flautist, and his flute seems to be more of an extension of him than the actual instrument itself. So first, Nestor, can you share with us your journey uh, from child to musician who inspired you and what music's done for you? Well, my father was a musician, so uh, as long as I can remember, um, music has been a part of my life. And some of my earliest memories are my cousins and I just banging on pots and pans, accompanying my father who played the vibraphone, he played the piano. And so it was that uh, I, I kept on banging and Santa Claus brought me a small but professional drum set when I was okay. five years old. My cousins, a couple of male cousins of mine also were into the music, they also played drums. When we went to middle school in Puerto Rico, there's a, a, a part of a system called Escuelas Libres de Musica, or free, free music schools, in which part of the day, you know, after your regular school hours, you would go to the music school. My cousins decided to join, uh, and okay, so they're going, I'll, I'll go too, but I didn't want to keep studying, quote unquote, the drums. So when it came time uh, for the admissions test, they asked, what is the uh, what instrument do you want to learn? And you know, being around instruments since I was a toddler, you know, trumpets, trombones, you know, saxophones, nothing really caught my eye until I saw the picture of a flute up in the blackboard in the room I was taking the test. I said, like, you know what? I'll 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 I'll, uh, I'll try that. I'll play that. And so uh, my father was not impressed because at the time, you know, if you played the flute, you were also expected to play the clarinet, to play the saxophone. Right. But I'm yeah. 12 years old. So, you know, he saw that I was serious and, and uh, so he encouraged me to study and turn me on to some recordings from Ron Paul to Cuban Music and Herbie Mann and so on. And that's how I got started in my flute playing. That's amazing because when you, when you go from, you know, there's different visuals you get. Drums, because my son played the drums. Mm -hmm. My other son played the guitar. 45, 50 years ago, I started on the clarinet. And I actually yeah. doubled and went to the saxophone. So it's interesting uh -huh. that you mentioned that your dad said, hey, you are expected to triple up sometimes right. and things like that. So not to be insulting, but uh, no one, not no one, few people that I know would think that the flute is cool. You make it look and sound beyond cool. Because when Thank you think you. about the drummer and the flautist, you know, so <laughs> it's such a big divide. It's interesting. Yeah. But it doesn't. It's a compliment. It doesn't look like you're playing an instrument. It looks like you're singing and dancing. Thank you. And the flute is doing it for you. So uh, Thank you that, for that. That, that's really that's really what I see as a musician. Not anywhere near the stratosphere you are, but that's what I look at. Thank so uh, yeah. So when I was in the high school band, you know, I, I, I've heard the flautists play, but you bring it to a whole new level, and it's not just to blow smoke or anything. It's just so different than when you hear a flautist. So yeah. what do you attribute your level? of playing to, you know, I mean, the level that you've reached? Well, a few components, and thank you for, for your kind words, by the way. Um, the first thing I would say, and I, you know, in very practical terms, is that relatively earlier on, I, uh, although, I, you know, my father was turning me on to jazz, flute, you know, Herbie Mann, and I was listening to Mozart or Bach being played. Uh, you know, it was like classical or jazz. And then the Latin component came in where I was listening to Cuban music. There's a Cuban music style called charanga in which uh, the, the flute has a, 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 a central role. You know, you have the song, the exposition to the song, and then there's like on the jam session, groove, the call and response, 
you know, the flu really pretty much takes over. So um, the first component was that I heard a, a flutist by the name, a flutist by the name of Hubert Gloss. And he had, you know, real thorough uh, Juilliard flute training education. Uh, he brought in the classical idiom to jazz. I mean, he had a phenomenal, phenomenally unique sound for his time. I mean, you're talking about a flutist that is bringing a bassoon, acoustic guitar, vibraphone, in addition to bass drum and piano, and adapting uh, the Rite of Spring or the Bradenburg Concerti into the jazz realm. So I was very impressed by that, which, and the main impression I got was that if I really wanted to be a, a flutist, a, a flute player worth my medal, I needed to engage in classical uh, uh, flute training. And so I did, and I attended in a conservatory, I managed a school of music, you know, had some private lessons with some great you know, teachers. But there was, so that's the first component. The second component is that while I was doing that, you know, late teens, early 20s, you know, recently arrived to New York from Puerto Rico, um, I had the opportunity to work in some of these Cuban bands. And so I had like on the job training uh, when it came to improvisation. So even before I was playing jazz, I was playing Cuban music. Um, and that language, you know, it's about the dancer, the improvisation. It's really melodious and rhythmic and to set up a groove for the dancer. So those are the two practical ing ingredients, I think, that really makes it my, my sound unique. Now, of course, as you mentioned, I was, you know, uh, uh, playing drums since I was five. So there's also a rhythmic groove component to it. Um, and overall, with, with all that said, you know, uh, there's two more uh, components. And the, 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 the next component is that I personally happen to like melodies. I, I happen to like m m melodic uh, music and, 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 and rhythm, you know, and rhythm, the rhythm, which reminds me uh, probably some of, the, of your folks, of your viewers, I mean, I'd be familiar with a fellow, his name was uh, Dick Clark, and he had a, a yeah. show, uh, yeah. television, a pioneering show. Sure. Which was called yeah. American Band, American Band, uh, American like a Band Bandstand, Band. Bandstand. And it was basically, you know, he'd be playing the, the, the hits of the moment, and you had a bunch of kids dancing, you know, it was just like that, right? So then he asked this girl, what is it that you like about this song? And she says, well, because he has, uh, uh, because he has a good rhythm and you can dance to it, you know? And so that uh, is a bit of a description as to my approach with music. And in conclusion, the overarching component is my intention. In my, I, I play in order to communicate with a sense of appreciation. I don't know if I'm going on a little too long. No, no, no. It's, if I can it's, elaborate it's, and just to bring it to a full close, as I just mentioned, there is a sense of appreciation and a sense of service in my playing to really serve, to reach out, to communicate. Uh, and, and that in itself, there's another layer. I just share the musical components of my style. There is the human component of who I am as an individual and, one, and what comes through in my music uh, based on who I am as a person and what my intention is. And one is the fact that um, uh, when I first moved to South Florida, it was because I was asked to join, you know, to come to relocate with the bands in New York I was playing with. They did well for a while, but then they stopped working and I started crumbling and I had to, you know, find my way through. It was a very, very, very difficult period. Uh, whereas, you know, I, I had to sell, you know, Coke bottles, you know, to get a few sense to buy some eggs and some juice. I mean, that level, yeah. which I, I wore that as a, you know, gold, badge of honor, yep. as a badge of honor that yeah. I got that struggle. So at this particular point, I was living in Hollywood, Florida at the time. And I had a piccolo, you know, very small food. And I went to the beach and I just went there to see, you know, and actually, uh, anyway, I, I was passing by this bar, a restaurant out by the, you know, outside. And um, the, uh, there is a great, uh, uh, a large Canadian community, which you call the snowbirds, uh, for the, for the oh, winter. Yes. Yes. Canadian folks come and, you know, spend time in Ottawa. Yeah. So they were mostly Canadian and they were, there was a nice band. And somehow I asked if I would sit in. And I did. I played, I remember it was uh, uh, Autumn Leaves. 
people loved it. And oh my gosh, the ovations. And where are you? What are you doing? They asked. So, well, right now, you know, somehow someone asked me, well, what do you need or what can we do? Uh, something like this. Well, you know, I said, well, I'm not working right now. And right away, people came up, you know, oh, wow. started giving me oh, uh, good. Bits. And and I and I I made twenty five dollars, and for the first time, that was a long time ago. That's when twenty five dollars meant something. Oh, absolutely! Yeah. I, it was huge. One hundred and fifty today. Uh, exactly. At the same time, you know, so for the first time, I, like in months and months, I was able to buy some steak and buy some real Ooh. food. I mean, that level. <laughs> right. But the reason I'm telling you this, and I'm going into detail about this, is because that taught me something very important, and that, and that is that. You can have all the talent in the world. You can be the greatest genius with the most amazing, incredible thing to offer. Unless there are people there to receive it, to accept it, Absolutely. to uh, uh, appreciate it, it means nothing. Absolutely. And so from that moment on, I really developed a profound sense of appreciation for the opportunity to give, to share, to communicate. And lastly, uh, some years later, I had uh, I, I developed a re great following in South Florida. We had a first jazz record, which was very successful. As uh, so we were getting ready to uh, record the second one, I was involved in a, in a near uh, fatal uh, boat accident. Oh, Ironically, you know. it was doing a, a celebrity boat race. I ended up with 18 fractures in my ribs, both oh. broken clavicles, collapsed lung. Uh, you know, the left scapula was fractured. It was really, really bad. How, how old are you? How old are you when that happened? I was in my early 30s. Okay. And so I remember, uh, you know, being under medication, you know, they had me with a little button for morphine. I called it the happy button whenever right. it was pain. And <laughs> had another pain for the, you know, tube in my, in my chest to, to, to take care of the lung or whatever. And so I would hear the other patients complaining and the doctors would come in and out, not even five minutes. The one constant that I had that I remembered was the nurses. Yeah. They were professional, they were steady, they were compassionate, they were there. And they are the ones that really took care of me and helped me heal. And I forget, and I remember rather, how one day I was listening in, in the midst of my fog medication, you know, a foggy state, I heard patients complaining and I thought, you know, I, go on stage for a couple of hours. At the most, I'll work in a club setting. I wasn't even doing that many clubs at the time. I'll be in a club and I'll work for three hours. I get paid very well. Nice. I, I am applauded. I am appreciated. And I am a star and I'm a, I'm a central figure. In the meantime, these nurses, nobody applauds them. Nobody pays attention. The money, the, 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 the doctors get most of the money. The patients only give them grief, and yet they are here saving lives and taking care of others. Okay. To me, those are the stars. They are the celebrities. So that deeply touched my life. And from that moment, from that time on, in addition to playing with appreciation, I play with this sense of how can I heal? How can I serve? How can I take care of? Just like those nurses took care of me. How can I use my music to take care of others? And so that's a real detailed, long answer that's okay. to your very pointed yes. question. <laughs> I, we want the details because again, it's, it's called Lighting the Educational Flame and we're all about education and a lot of pieces are sticking together. I mean, uh, before we spoke a little bit before the uh, actual interview started and I was in Florida from the age of 16 to 18 um, and I was hospitalized several times. Uh, I was diagnosed with epilepsy at the age of 16 and a half. That's how I got years later into writing my memoir and mm -hmm. meeting Susan Brender, who's usually my co-host on this show, and it comes full circle. So I, I also know, unfortunately, from too many stays in the hospital, how special mm -hmm. the, these people are. You mentioned some things that I want the parents, and if there's any of the teens listening to this. So I can kind of tell this from your playing. It's very interesting. I wish I knew this more when I was younger. Uh, I can kind of tell that you played other instruments because I listened to many renditions of different songs you did. So I listened to a rendition of uh, Somewhere Over the Rainbow. And I mm -hmm. always like to listen to a song, but I have to tell you halfway in, I almost forgot what the song was and was listening to you. Mm -hmm. And I just think, I don't know if it's, you know, I'm, you, I'm guessing you arrange most of your own things or something. So it's definitely more, I guess I, it is musical, but to me it sounds so personal sometimes. 
Indeed. And I think that it's a great idea. Me, I, it happened by accident because I did, you know, they wanted me in the jazz band and they didn't want a clarinetist in the jazz band. So I started to take uh, saxophone lessons. And then I do a little piano, a little bit here and there, but just not that I'm great at any of them, but just the knowledge of different instruments and not being married to just one instrument and just being open to learning. That's an important piece of what I heard you say today. So I think that that really speaks to you as a musician uh, as well. Um, so, you know, it's interesting to me because, as I said, I've heard many flautists in the school band, but I'm listening back in the 70s, late 70s, when I first moved to Florida, mm -hmm. I listened to Jethro Tull. Yes. And I heard some solos, and my wife knows all these groups from years ago, and I, you know, I only know the, the five groups that I like, and I didn't know all these others, and I said, who the heck was that? Is that like mm -hmm. a guest artist? And she said, right. oh, oh it's, it's Jethro Tull. And I was not surprised to look at your website and see that you've mentioned him and you, you talk about him and some of these others as uh, flute giants. So mm -hmm. what have you learned? Forget about, you know, just from your people who, who trained you, who gave you lessons and from your practicing and your classical. What have you learned from these flute giants, your word, uh, that you mentioned? Well, what I learned from these flute uh, 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 mentors or elders uh, or giants upon which shoulders we stand today, as I, I mentioned earlier, Hubert Laws. Hubert Laws brought to me the importance of impeccable technique and an impeccable sound. Uh, Richard Egg was, was a Cuban flute player in the genre that I mentioned, charanga. His melodiousness, I mean, the, the, his sense of melody and the combination of flawless technique and, and at moments virtuosity, but at the, at the service of making musical statements, he was a big influence. Uh, Herbie Mann, because he was one of the early, you know, uh, uh, he was a groundbreaker when he came to, when he came to making the flute a viable jazz uh, instrument. And then of course, Jean-Pierre Rampal, by virtue of the fact that he was a standard bearer at the time of, of what classical flute was about. Uh, there are others, as the boss and Lucas Graf and so on, but I would say that these are the, 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 the main reasons and the main influences of uh, these uh, uh, flutists. Uh, and that's what that they gave me, you know, like for example, from, I, I knew I, need to, I needed to study classical music. Right. I also knew that I needed to play, you know, uh, for the dancers. So, so uh, 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 making, uh, you know, one of the band, first band leaders that I worked with, Andy Gonzalez, he's no longer with us. It was the Latin band com, called com, Conjunto Libre. And he described my playing as being talkative. And so I guess it was all this that I'm sharing with you, and, and as I'm you know, seeking to answer your questions, there is, uh, I think, also just the, the, the one's own individuality. And in the end, uh, back to your point about the young folks that are in band and, and musical education, you know, to me, uh, musical education is absolutely imperative in the development of a, uh, the development of one's character. For music, is a wonderful way of expression, and I correlate and I always talk about this that music is life and life is music. You know, um, if I may go on just a little longer, please. Uh, for example, you know. In music, we have the instrument, right? So we're giving the instruments. So our first, whatever, maybe. We start like that, and eventually. Yeah. Yep. What I didn't get here by. Uh, like, just like right, it, it just took a long time to, to get there, you know. And so, uh, uh, and, and then when you're improvising, uh, let's say you know, you play, let's say, live music, you play two chords, mm -hmm. right? And the two chords, you're supposed to have a ma two, ma two major scales, let's say, uh, C and um, and then the arpeggio. And the next chord is a, what is called a G7, which is a scale of C, but you start in G. Okay, so the rules are that as long as you play with those notes, 
and keeping in mind those centers, you're going to be fine. Okay, but then what happens if you break the rules? So you get out of the rules and stuff like that. So that's in music right now in life. We start by, you know, crawling. Then we start, you know, like trying to find our way, walking until we are able to walk. We go to school. Then we, we receive an education. And so we're educated, allegedly, to live lives of value, to be prepared to deal with the real world. Yeah. Well, I, I would bet that everyone here listening has experience so that whatever they learn in school, when it's time to go out there into the real world and apply it, they realize that what they think that they knew doesn't yeah. quite yeah. apply. And so then you feel, well, but this is not what I learned. This not, knowledge doesn't mean anything. So I have to find my way. And then I have to improvise very much like in music. Yep. I just thought until later on that you realize that what you had learned, although it didn't seem to work in, you know, as you were applying it, yes, those fundamental principles were there, but ultimately you have to, live you have to get out there to live your life and that's how you learn and develop and expand your knowledge and most importantly your wisdom the same thing happens when you get on stage you know you're yeah, first for the band whether it's listening or for the conductor if you're going to improvise you're bound to make all kinds of mistakes but that's how you really find your way therefore when a young person has the opportunity to learn music and to, to, to master an instrument and to, to work with others and to work under the, uh, the directorship of a conductor, those are tools that inevitably can be transferred and applied to our daily lives. And so um, I guess we went from one subject to the other, but yeah, that's, no, that's a great. Yeah. Well, when you mentioned musical statement, uh, it's interesting because people, if, if I would say to young people, I mean, I taught over, over three decades, if I said, so tell me why you like music. Nine out of 10 of them would say, well, the words have such a nice message, this and that. But when you play, there are no words. And I can still hear a message yes. uh, from when you play. And that, that doesn't happen by accident. But the appreciation and the respect that you have for the music really comes through with your playing. And I, I love the analogy of music is life because it really is. And even bad times and when we hear certain songs of, uh, of strength, even during the protests and and problems uh, that we've had in the past six or eight months. Music is always like that common denominator to break mm -hmm. us out of it. And I know that you, you know, you talk about standing on the uh, shoulders of giants and, and uh, I, you know, many consider you a giant now. And I know you've had some kind of connection to, I think, Florida International University. Is that the school where you've had some kind of- uh, Yes, for a while, I, I, yes. On uh, uh, a couple of occasions I taught there, first as an exam professor, uh, at about 12, 10, 12 years, uh, year, years later, in the same capacity, but I was able to, I was a founder of, of the Danzon Charanga Ensemble. So the, I did uh, teach with uh, them. I, I wish I would have stayed. At the time, though, my, my travel and touring schedule right. just got in the way, and I, and I was really uh, placing priority on my performing career at the time. And it was just very challenging. And, and it didn't it was unfair to the students that I would not be there most of the time. So I, I needed to, to step down on that. But yeah, Florida International University is a tremendous institution. I have seen it grown from the days of President Molesto Malique. You know, uh, now, you know, it is, uh, you know, uh, Mark um, Rosen is, is, I believe is his name. Uh, okay. The, the president of FIU. Okay. And for the, for the life of me, are you able to edit this out? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> If I have to, well, let me look at the timestamp, but uh, we'll be able yeah. to do that, I'm sure. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, it's not because I have so much respect for the president, the current right. president of FIU, and he's, uh, I don't want to forget his name, but, but he's really a great guy. And so it's a great institution. I'm very proud to have been part of it. Outstanding. And uh, yeah, so, so when we talk about young people and institutions in college, I'm going to use a bad word for teenagers. Uh, Practice. What, what is about what is about work with them? Practice. <laughs> oh. So when I heard that, my parents proud, and I love the instrument, but you know, practice when you, some people have to be forced. What is a practice? What should a practice session look like? Oh man, uh, there's a couple of ways of look at it. In, in purely practical terms, if you're playing with an instrument, sound. You spend time on sound, long notes.
and you do that to you know like finding the best sound you can it's not uh, like a tedious thing or oh, they just make the instrument sound oh my gosh i have to do this but rather we could do it that way and then it becomes a, an endless painful austerity or we can get into oh let's see okay how is that sound oh man this sounds not good uh always being careful not to be too judgmental or put oneself down, but oh, I need to do better with this. How is it? And then you can make it into a process, like a, a, an adventure. Then it becomes an investigative research. How can I really, then it becomes a challenge. How can I really get this? It's really all how you really uh, set yourself to, 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 to do this, you know? And, and the other component, uh, interestingly, comes from, from the likes of Schwarzenegger and, and and, mm -hmm. and, and Johnson in terms of their days as, as, as athletes mm -hmm. in which they talk about, it's about having a vision of what you want to accomplish. See yourself or hear yourself where you want to go, understanding that each scale, that each long note, that each exercise, each etude that you're practicing, though it's seemingly not related to making music, but it's what's really getting you closer to being able to make music and to mastering that that skill and 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 once again i go back to the principle of it's not about just about the music or about the instrument it's really about the principle of having the willingness to make a commitment to master a craft or a skill or an art and and be fully engaged in it that is a fundamental universal principle that applies to all aspects of life yep. because unless you're able to really be you know to engage in that process to challenge yourself to strengthen your, and strengthen yourself to confront your laziness and i'm going to get a little heavy here yeah. you know the the fundamental demons the fundamental barriers that we will come across which are all both universal and individual at the same time cowardice Uh, laziness, yeah. uh, arrogance, uh, yeah. and so those things, you know, really will do us away. And then, you know, and then we're in a society that, you know, the most expedient thing: I deserve it, I want it, I don't want to have to work for wait, it. Yeah, yeah. Well, wait, yep. But now, sooner, you know, it's okay that you can get it without working for it, but sooner or later, you're going to have to end up paying a price for that when you don't have the training, when you don't know what it's like, for example, uh, and you're asking poignant questions, Mark, so you're getting me to talk. <laughs> Good, that's the idea, I thank you. Um, just recently I read something, and I wish I had it with me, in, in, in which this individual, someone wrote and said, imagine yourself being born in 1900. Okay. By the time you were 14 years old, you would have experienced First World War, in which, however, five, like, uh, I don't know how many tens of millions of people died. Shortly thereafter, as soon as, you know, no sooner or right around right, right the time that the First World War was finished, the Spanish flu epidemic yeah. came out and it wiped out another like 20 million people on yeah. the face of the earth. Yeah. By the time you reach 28 years old, you're faced with the worst economical financial depression ever. ever experienced in history. And you're not even 30 yet because by the time you hit 30 or 33, Hitler comes to power in Germany. And by the time you know, you're know you 45 or you're, or you're 40 or 41, the wo Second World War happens. And by the time you're 45, an atomic drum a, a bomb has been dropped. You know, by the time you're 50, the Korea, we, uh, Korean War starts. By the time you're in your 60s, the Vietnam War. You know, by the time, you know, and so it is that people that have endured all these hardships, and we need to be aware, look, after World War I, the, you know, especially in Europe, the world as, as it was known ceased to exist completely. And, and then, it happened again less than what? Between 18 and, and 40, how many years was that? Like less than 25 years later, they were completely obliterated again. And so here today, we're complaining and making a ruckus 
because we don't want to wear masks mm -hmm. and because we don't want to keep distance. You see? So I'm not criticizing or, or it's just the, just making an observation about the nature yeah. of human nature. Why are we making such a ruckus about wearing masks, about, uh, 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 you know, social distancing, about having to stay at home? Because we do not know what those levels of hardship are. Right. We don't know what it's like to, to, to one day, you know, be, you know, be fine. And, and the next moment, your house and, and your entire city is completely wiped out of the face of the earth. Right. Like so many people in Syria and so many other places are experiencing. So you see, I, I'm, I'm making exaggerated points, but the essence of it is that as young people, it is absolutely essential that, that we train ourselves, that you, that you learn about hardship. And if you don't have hardship, seek it. And by the way, everything I'm sharing with you is not so much things I've made up. It's things that I have learned from a mentor. There's a mentor in life. I consider him to be my mentor in life, Mr. Daisaku Ikeda. And, 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 and through his example and his guidance and also what I have lived, I can really just say, when you say like seek hardship, seek the challenge. You don't want to do it. That's why you really need to do it. You don't want to practice. I don't want to practice and I am going to practice. Right. You know, like, that kind of resilience and, and, and self-challenge and self-motivation against all odds, that's really the key, not just to being a winner, but ultimately being victorious in life. Absolutely. Great, great messages, great stories. I know it's a pandemic, but could you tell us about upcoming events or where people can learn even more about Nesta Torres? Well, go to our, our artist page on Facebook, also Nesta Torres Official uh, uh, on Instagram. We have been actually doing a series of performances online, live stream. Uh, uh, you know, we are, um, if, you know, um, the dates as of today have not been quite determined, but okay. I just finished doing, uh, preparing live, uh, uh, live stream performances for an organization in Boston. I will be doing some performances for the Spanish Monastery here in okay. Florida. Okay. I will be going to Charleston. Uh, on November uh, uh, from the 18th through the 22nd to do some performances there uh, that have been postponed from March. So just, you know, go to our Facebook. That's where you, gotcha. you can also go to uh, nestratories.com, but our Facebook page, really, you can uh, be in touch and, and send us a, a message and, and I will uh, personally respond if I can. That's great. That's great. I love to teach as well, too. And uh, Yes, and you taught a lot today. <laughs> you taught your share today for sure. I can't, Nestor, I can't thank you enough for joining me today, sharing your incredible story, your views. Uh, thank you so much. To the viewers, remember to reach out to us on social media. Look for great success on Facebook and Twitter. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, you can also find me, Mark Hobman, on LinkedIn, NestorTorres.com. Again, Nestor Torres, thanks for being with us. Uh, and viewers, don't forget to tune in to our next podcast. This is Mark Hobman thanking you for watching the podcast, Lighting the Educational Flame on the Great Success Education channel on the NETV network. Have a great day. Nestor, thank you so much. Thank you, Mark. Best for us. Thank you for listening to Lighting the Educational Flame with Mark Overman. To contact Mark, email him at info at gradesuccess.com.